do not be afraid. These words occur regularly throughout the pages of scripture of the Old and New Testaments. Some have suggested that they occur as many as 300 times. They appear as a plea, as an encouragement, as a request, and perhaps even as a commandment. And the reason why they appear so often is, I think, obvious. They speak into a myriad of different contexts. The wilderness community, the people in exile, Mary and the discovery that she is pregnant, the disciples on a stormy lake and in an upstairs room, the early churches in Asia Minor. But one thing connects all of these contexts. In each, someone or some group are afraid. So, do not be afraid or words spoken to those who are living in fear. It is inevitable that fear will continue to grip our lives for a long time to come. That will be fear of the virus, but it will also be fear about the economic, social, emotional, spiritual and physical reality of the lockdown. It will be about boarded up shops, but also about broken down lives. It will be about the light that has gone out behind some people's eyes and the fear of being touched and of touching. That fear is not going to go away quickly and we are going to have to learn to live with it, recognise it and sit with it. This will be about the church being authentic and real, acknowledging brokenness and fragility amongst others and amongst ourselves. We cannot and should not spin the gospel into some saccharine party or sprint back to what was normal. For normal was not good for far too many people. And what went before and is still with us is destroying our planet. Those of us who have known the pain of grief will know that it cannot be dealt with quickly. And we're grateful to those who, when we were grieving and afraid, took time to sit with us, often in silence, and who listened without the provision of easy and anodyne answers. Taking time to listen should, I think, be the primary mark of the post-pandemic church. Let's not rush too quickly to answers, to solutions, to a fresh, sorry, to a fresh wave of frenzied activity. Let's take time to hear the uncertainty and the sadness. Take time to learn about the new things which have emerged, the new friendships, the new circles of care which have bubbled up, perhaps while we have not been around as much. Let's not see these things as competitors, but as collaborators, as together we try to make Earth look a bit more like heaven. Let's not set up a whole range of new activities that treat people as if they're hapless or of little value. Instead, let us treat people as we would treat Jesus. 
And let's look out not just for people, but for all creation. And let's, as we think about what engaging with our communities looks like, as we listen to them, that then we should also be listening to God. One of the things that we're prone to do when we are anxious or afraid is to make ourselves busy. And there is a temptation that the church, which will have been changed and almost certainly institutionally weakened over these last weeks and months, will somehow feel that we have to make up for lost time. Don't. Don't act out of fear for ourselves. Instead, let's act out of love.